Good evening, everyone. Hello. I'm going to keep my stopwatch on. And um, thank you to uh, Students for Justice in Palestine at Hampshire College for having me. Um, it's been really amazing to be traveling around with my new book, The Battle for Justice in Palestine. It seems the timing could not have been more. I swear I didn't plan it like this, but it seems like with everything that's happening, the timing to have this discussion couldn't have been more appropriate. Yesterday I was at Northeastern University in Boston, which as many of you know has made history by becoming the first uh, university in the United States to ban outright the Students for Justice in Palestine group on completely bogus uh, grounds, basically it's censorship. And yesterday there were a couple of things going on on campus. I, my talk had been planned for a while since before the totally undemocratic uh, suspension of SJP. Uh, but then it had to be reorganized because now they couldn't book rooms, they couldn't get funds, whatever, you know. So it was an amazing opportunity for uh, renewed solidarity for other groups on campus to rally around and to uh, support their uh, fellow students who had been uh, banned from exercising their democratic rights. And at the same time as we were having our outlaw event, the uh, university administration was welcoming uh, a delegation of Israeli parliamentarians you know, giving them the red carpet treatment in another campus building. And these were parliamentarians from parties like uh, Habayt HaYehudi, the Jewish home, which are explicitly racist. They talk about Palestinians and Africans as a demographic threat to Israel. And yet there's no uh, compunction about giving them the red carpet treatment. That's what we're challenging. That, that's the kind of no, normal politics that we have to challenge and, and change. And I'm really happy to be here at Hampshire College in particular. Um, Hampshire College plays a special role in uh, this movement uh, for uh, solidarity with Palestine on US campuses. And I was here once before in 2009. And this room. Was anyone else here on that day? Yeah. There's at least one hand going up. And that was the uh, BDS conference that was held here at Hampshire College. And a couple of hundred people came from all over the country and gathered. And at that time, uh, you know, there were workshops. We had plenary meetings in here, but there were workshops about how to do a divestment campaign on campus. And the reason why uh, it was held here at Hampshire College is because of Hampshire College's own history. Uh, Hampshire boasts on its website, I'm told, that it was the first uh, US uh, university or college to divest from apartheid South Africa. And uh, it's proud enough of that fact to advertise it and hope that that attracts people to visit or to, to other <coughs> students. Uh, Hampshire College doesn't advertise the fact that it's the first college also to divest from companies that profit from Israeli occupation. The university uh, is very coy about that, and the college rather is very coy about that in public, although the history of it is, is well known and has been documented in a film which many of you uh, may have seen. And that's really a proud achievement, and it was because uh, Hampshire, before anyone had done this, uh, that people came here and there were workshops to learn uh, from uh, students at Hampshire, many of whom are now, of course, uh, alums who've gone on to do other things, how they did it. And it seems almost not a day goes by without uh, a, a vote or a controversy uh, r around divestment on one campus or another. There's too many for me to mention, but it's just been some, 
people are calling it Divestapalooza because of all <laughs> the divestment votes that are going on in student governments around the country. It's happened from you know coast to coast, and recently there have been really big battles at the University of Michigan, uh, which have gained you know uh, major, uh, even national and international media attention, and uh, so. In the five years since I was here, almost five years, uh, a lot has happened. The, the uh, battle for justice in Palestine has taken tremendous strides forward, and it is really more fierce than ever. And um, so I even start the book with what you might think is a, a, an outlandish statement. I start the first sentence is, very simply, the Palestinians are winning. And uh, I make the argument that that's in no small part because of, um, because of the work that students, generations of students, uh, are doing uh, on campus. So I'll say a bit more about that, but I thought I would uh, read just a couple of pages from the book about how Israel is fighting back against this movement. And you'll see the connection to Hampshire College uh, in, this, in this passage. All right. When there are efforts to boycott or divest from Israel, we will stand against them. And whenever an effort is made to delegitimize the state of Israel, my administration has opposed them. That vow by President Barack Obama was made to generous applause <coughs> at the 2012 policy conference in Washington, D.C. of APAC, the American Israel <coughs> Public Affairs Committee. Uh, it offered proof that the Palestinian-led movement for boycott, divestment, and sanctions toward Israel, BDS, had come of age. Here was the President of the United States pushing back against an effort that just a few years earlier was easily dismissed as irrelevant. It was only in 2004 that the Palestinian <coughs> campaign for the academic and cultural boycott of Israel was launched. And a year later, that 170 Palestinian civil society groups issued what has come to be known as the BDS call. Inspired by the international campaign that helped isolate apartheid South Africa in the 1970s, 80s, and early 90s. It is an appeal to global civil society to launch broad-based campaigns to boycott, divest from, and sanction Israel until Israel respects the human rights and the right to self-determination of Palestinians by ending its occupation and colonization of all the territories occupied in 1967 ending systematic discrimination against Palestinian citizens of Israel, and respecting promote, and promoting the rights of Palestinian refugees, including the right of return. In his important book, BDS, The Global Struggle for Palestinian <coughs> Rights, human rights activist and campaign co-founder Omar Barghouti traces the origins and spectacular growth of this movement through fits, starts, and setbacks, explains its principles and refutes its critics. Boosted in the wake of Operation Cast Lead, which killed 1,400 people in Gaza, uh, Israel's three-week-long military campaign in Gaza, and Israel's May 2010 assault on the Gaza flotilla, which killed nine activists aboard the Mavi Marmara, the BDS movement has emerged, in Barghouti's words, as a qualitatively new stage in the century-old Palestinian resistance to the Zionist settler colonial conquest, and later Israel's regime of occupation, dispossession, and apartheid against the indigenous people of Palestine. But while Obama uttered the Palestine Solidarity Movement's terms boycott and divest, <coughs> albeit to pledge his opposition to them, by referring to delegitimization, he expressed that opposition using the terminology prescribed for him by Israel and its lobby. 
it was a sign of just how seriously Israel's high-powered sponsors had begun to take the threat from grassroots activism. In early 2010, the Reut Institute, an Israeli think tank, founded in 2004 by Gidi Grinstein, an advisor in the office of Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak in the late 1990s, and a head of strategic planning in Israel's navy, recast Israel's war against its enemies away from actual battlefields. Instead, it shifted the focus to college campuses, union halls, churches, and other civil society venues around the world, but especially in the United States. Israel's traditional strategic doctrine, which viewed threats to the state's existence in primarily military terms to be met with a military response, was badly out of date. Uh, so the Reut Institute argued. What Israel now faced was a combined threat from a resistance network and a delegitimization network. These are their terms. The resistance network, Reut argued, is made up of groups including Hamas and Hezbollah that wage asymmetrical armed struggle against Israel and whose goal is not military victory but to bring about Israel's political implosion, like apartheid South Africa, East Germany, or the Soviet Union. In what Greenstein termed an unholy alliance with the resistance, resistance network was the delegitimization network, the whole panoply of Palestine solidarity and human rights groups and activities, especially the BDS movement. The hubs of this delegitimization network were in global cities such as London, Madrid, Toronto, and San Francisco. The rising tide of delegitimization, the Reut Institute warned, formed a significant strategic and even existential threat to Israel. A harbinger of how imminent the threat might be, Reut estimated, would be, quote, the collapse of the two-state solution as an agreed framework for resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and the coalescence behind a one-state solution as a new alternative framework. If that coalescence has not yet occurred, it is plainly the case that doubt about the viability of a two-state solution and interest in and support for a single state are even more commonplace today than they were when the Reut Institute published its warning. Nowadays, it is sincere defenders of the two-state solution who feel like outsiders and dissidents. The Reut Institute even saw a warning in my words, quoting a speech I gave to the 2009 student conference on BDS at Hampshire College, explaining that the apartheid regime in South Africa was never defeated militarily. The regime had retained its unassailable military advantage to the very end. Rather, something else did apartheid in. The loss of legitimacy, this is the quote from my speech here, the loss of legitimacy in the practices of the South African apartheid regime is what changed. And when a system loses its legitimacy, all the weapons in the world cannot protect it. And we're beginning to see a similar loss of legitimacy for Zionism. Um, Based on that analysis, the Reut Institute put forward a strategy that we're now seeing, we're seeing play out to this day. And it has a number of elements that I think are worth uh, talking about. Uh, they, they actually recommended to the Israeli government that it should sabotage and attack the Palestine Solidarity Movement. Those were the words it used. And that this should focus on organizations uh, which they describe as left-wing, uh, and particularly in the United States and in Europe, that support boycott, divestment, and sanctions, or argue for uh, a one-state solution, for example. And uh, that assault has taken a number of forms that I'll say something about in a minute. But the other side of the strategy, and I also talked about this uh, here at Hampshire when it was just beginning to emerge, 
is kind of a charm offensive. And the Reut Institute report, and again, it was adopted wholesale by the Israeli government and by pro-Israel organizations in the United States and Europe, uh, said that the most valuable constituency, you know, the, the long-term goal is to maintain support for Israel in the United States, that without the support of the US government, Israel is in a very precarious uh, position. And therefore, the goal is to, to shore up and uh, gain long-term support. The most valuable support will come from those the Reut Institute describes as progressive and liberal, and particularly college students who are you know, the, the, those who are shaping the future trends of society. And so Israel has to market itself to these groups. And the strategies they've used are strategies that some of you may have heard of pinkwashing and greenwashing as examples. Uh, pinkwashing is, is a critical term. It's not the term Israel would use. But it, it involves marketing and presenting Israel as uh, you know, a, a haven of uh, LGBT rights uh, in a supposedly an ocean of intolerance and extremism. And it involves trying to market Israel, uh, particularly for um, uh, gay male sex tourism. They don't advertise to uh, other LGBTQ people. They only advertise it uh, primarily using images of uh, gay white men to attract them to Tel Aviv and so on. Uh, that's an example of pinkwashing, and there's a whole range of activities. And pinkwashing is something that uh, other entities do. Uh, in the summer, I was in uh, in Toronto, and I gave a talk on pinkwashing during a Pride weekend, and people were talking about pinkwashing by banks and corporations that are putting up. Uh, you know, rainbow flags, and uh, and saying that you know, just putting a a, fl uh, a rainbow flag on your uh, exploitive corporation doesn't, you know, make us like it or feel welcome. <laughs> but that, you know, the, the principle is the same. And greenwashing, the idea is similar. It's it's about uh, uh, tapping into growing concern for the environment. Uh, you know, in the in the era of the the global environmental crisis because of uh, climate change, we're not supposed to call it uh, global warming, but that's what it is. Climate change is actually a term that Republican uh, pollsters came up with, I believe, that you know that takes emphasis off the the heating up of the planet and presenting Israel as a pioneer in solar technologies and in water management and so on. And in the book, I, I, I talk about a number of these examples and show how utterly bogus they are. Israel is not only not a pioneer in uh, solar technology, it, it actually uses very antiquated technology. And some of this has been brought to the United States and is doing a terrible damage in the Mojave Desert and other places where these steam powered, uh, so, uh, obsolete solar plants have been set up. Um, mm. But it's also uh, not, uh, uh, it, it wastes tremendous amounts of water. Now Israel is uh, really responsible for the, one of the uh, most severe environmental crises anywhere, which is the disappearance of the Dead Sea, the rapid disappearance of the Dead Sea because of Israel's uh, siphoning off and misuse of the headwaters of the, the Jordan River, among other things. So, you know, the, this, this propaganda is, is not only irrelevant. I mean, even if it were true that Israel is great at solar panels, how would that justify apartheid? <laughs> right? But it's not even true. It's, it's not even true. So um, anyway, th these strategies of pinkwashing and greenwashing have formed another, another part. And, and, and you know, it, it involves a whole host of propaganda about Israel as a startup nation and a technolo technological pioneer and so on. 
that distracts from the